One of the most fascinating aspects of a computer is how they can remember. So in this video, we'll build up the basics of computer memory, starting at latches and flip-flops, building up to RAM and ROM, as well as see how a computer can make choices, such as with a traffic light or a sequence detector. The first and most basic component of any memory system is a latch. A latch is any component that can store its previous value. The simplest latch we can come up with is if we combine two NOT gates. This output Q could be a 1, in which case it stays a 1, regardless of any inputs, but it could also be a 0. The value is whatever it already was, which means that this is a latch. Let's now look at some actually useful latches. First we have the SR latch. We can get an SR latch if we replace the NOT gates with NOR gates. These two extra inputs are S for set and R for reset. Let's redraw this circuit a bit to reflect the symmetry. To understand how the circuit works, all we have to do is make a truth table. Let's start with the case of both S and R0. The top gate receives both not Q and 0, which means that the output is just Q. The same story for the bottom gate with the output not Q. What this means is that the output is the previous value whenever S and R are both 0, which means we have created a latch. Let's now look at the case when S is 1 and R0. The bottom gate outputs a 0 because of S. This 0 then moves up to the top gate where you get two zeros, which give an output of 1. This means that Q is 1 and not Q is 0 when S becomes 1. This is why it's called a set, because it sets the value of Q to 1. Now let's turn S off again and turn R into a 1. In this case, the top gate now outputs a 0, the 0 travels down and we get two 0 inputs, which give a 1 for not Q. We have reset the value of Q to 0. And finally, we have the case of both S and R being 1. In this case, both NOR gates output a 0, so both Q and NOT Q are 0. Since Q and NOT Q have the same value, we view this as a sort of illegal set of inputs. It's also not really useful, since if we want Q to be 0, we can just turn R into a 1 and S into a 0. So let's just look at these three cases instead. It might get bothersome drawing out this whole diagram, so let's simplify an SR latch with this symbol. Let me propose to you a new latch, called a D latch which we want to have the following properties to simplify the logic. We have one input, D, which just handles whether Q should be on or off. So if D is 0, Q becomes 0. And if D is 1, Q becomes 1. But to still have to be a latch which is able to retain its old value, we add something called a clock. The value of Q doesn't change when the clock is 0, but when the clock is 1, the value of Q is whatever D is. As you can see, it's much simpler to think about D for the next value and just think about a clock to see whether or not we change. Let's get to building this D-latch. Let's first look at the reset input. This turns Q into 0, which should only happen when D is 0 and the clock is 1. To implement this behavior, we just connect a NOT gate with D and end it with a clock. Now for the set input. This turns Q into 1, which should only happen when D is 1 and the clock is 1. So you can put an AND gate here. We have now created the D-latch, which doesn't have any of the problems the SR-latch had when both S and R were 1. Now you have all of the information you need to store data in a circuit, but there's still room for improvement. You see, the reason why it's called a clock is that in most processors, such as the one in the device you're watching this video on right now, the clock is a signal from a crystal oscillator that keeps switching from 0 to 1 at regular intervals. The idea is that in a window of time when the clock is 0, you have the time to let your components switch from zeros to ones, and vice versa, and do their logic. But the moment the clock hits one, you should be done with all of these calculations and let the values get stored. There are a few problems with this current design. There is a possibility of signals moving through components at slightly different times because of external effects like temperature deviations or small errors during manufacturing. As well as glitches, temporary unwanted changes in signals occurring in some components. To counteract these problems, we want to shorten the window of time in which no signals should change. In the ideal case, this would be a single, well-defined moment whenever a clock rises from 0 to 1, the so-called rising edge of the clock. In the real world, this isn't a single, well-defined moment in time, but instead a tiny interval. But how do we build such a component that only reacts to the rising edge of the clock? The solution is to use two D latches. The second one contains the actual value of Q, whereas the first one stores an intermediate value we can use. 
take a look at one cycle of the clock signal. The idea is to store the intermediate value of Q in this first half of the period, then output a new value in the second half. During the first half of the period, the clock signal is zero, so we need a NOT gate here to store the intermediate value. For the second latch, we can simply connect the clock signal. So now we have our new and improved memory element, the D flip-flop, usually shown as this symbol. There do exist other types of flip-flops, such as the SR flip-flop, the JK flip-flop, and the T flip-flop. Let's say with D flip-flops for now, because it's the most common one. Let's say we want to store the color purple using our memory elements. If you remember from the last video, a color is 32 bits wide, so we'll need 32 flip-flops to store the information. Connecting off the corresponding high and low values, and let the clock run from 0 to 1, we've now stored the color purple. And in a similar way, we can store any other type of information. A group of flip-flops that share the same clock is called a register. So what we have created here is a 32-bit register. Just to simplify notation, we can draw a register like this. These input and output wires are no longer single wires carrying values like 0 or 1, but now they are buses, which are a collection of different wires. As our final modification, we can add resets and enable our flip-flops. These function just as you would expect. Enable for deciding whether or not the current value can be changed, and reset for turning the stored value into zero. Before we can delve into some cool applications like a traffic light and a sequence detector, we have to learn one more abstract thing, called the finite state machine. And to explain it, let's take a look at Pac-Man. In case you don't know, in the game of Pac-Man you are this yellow guy whose goal is to eat off the dots in the maze, whilst trying to avoid the four ghosts. There are also power pellets, which frighten the ghosts after Pac-Man eats them, and allows him to temporarily eat the ghosts. For our purposes right now, we are mostly interested in each ghost's unique personality. Each of the ghosts have four behaviors. Scatter, which is moving to a specific corner. Chase, which is chasing Pac-Man. Frightened, which is running away from Pac-Man. And Eaten, which is returning back to home base. In a finite state machine, each of these behaviors is called a state. To transition from one state to another, you use different inputs. The first of these is whether Pac-Man just ate a power pellet or not. In which case, the ghosts go from chase and scattered to frightened. And they go back when their power runs out again. If Pac-Man touched a ghost in the frightened state, they go to the eaten state. After which they return back home and go to either the scattered or the chase state. Finally, when a ghost is in either the scatter or the chase state, after a while they might switch between them. This diagram right here is called a state transition diagram. And what a finite state machine is, is a circuit which receives some inputs, which in our case is eating a power pellet, eating a ghost, and the timer changing the ghost's behavior. It then uses these inputs to switch between these states. To do anything useful with these ideas, Let's assign numbers to everything. All of the four states can be encoded by S0 and S1. We have three inputs, which we can encode with three variables. P for power pellet, E for ETH, and T for time. If we want to make a circuit that can do the relevant logic, we'll need a two-bit register, which receives our three inputs, P, E, and T, and then does some logic with them. But of course, we don't only want our inputs, because then we'd always get the same answer. What we want now as well is our current state, S0 and S1. What should the relevant logic in here be? To see that, we just need to make a table, a so-called state transition table. For all of our current states and inputs, we can write what the output should be. This x here means that we don't care whether the value is a 0 or a 1. As always, just simplify the logic and we get this circuit. Combining everything, we have our Pac-Man finite state machine. Every clock cycle, we enter our three inputs, whether Pac-Man has an active power pellet, whether Pac-Man just ate a ghost, and whether the timer ran out. We then just let the machine run to see what state we'll end up in. Let's do two other examples. First, a sequence detector. Let's say we have a robot which reads a number every clock cycle, which is our input. The number can only be 0 or 1 and our goal is to figure out when the number 001 has been read, in which case we output a 1, 
The situation is different from our previous one, because now, not only do we have an input, but we also have an output. Handling output can be done in two main ways, using more machines and using media machines. Let's start with a more machine, because the simplest of the two. Let's say we start off in state S0. In this case, we haven't read anything before yet, so our output should be a 0. Then we have two possibilities. We either read a 0 or a 1. If we read a 0, we are one step closer to having read the whole sequence, so we can move on to state S1. If we read a 1, however, we are no closer to reading the sequence, so we should stay in state S0. In state S1, we haven't read the whole sequence yet, so we should still output a 0. Our two possible inputs are either 0 or 1. If we read a 0, we are once again one step closer to reading a whole sequence, so we can move on to state S2. But if we read a 1, we should go back to state S0. Once again in state S2, we output a 0, because we haven't read the whole sequence yet. But if we now read a 1, we can go to the final state of S3. If we read a 0, we don't go back to S0, but instead stay in state S2, because three zeros in a row is still part of the sequence if we end in a 1. Finally, in S3 we output a 1, because we did find the whole sequence. Inputting a 1 means that the sequence has been ruined, so we go back to S0. But inputting 0 means we might be part of a new sequence, so we go to S1. As you can see, in all of our states, the output depends only on our current state. The concept of a melee machine allows us to use less states to create the same sequence detector, but as a downside, the output not only depends on the current state, but also on the current input. Let's look at the same sequence detector, but this time using a melee machine. Once again, we start in state S0, but this time we don't output anything. We have two choices, an input of 0 or an input of 1. If our input is 0, we can move on to state S1, and we output a 0, because we didn't find anything. We write our output next to our input with a slash to differentiate between them. If our input is 1, we stay in the current state and output a 0. In state S1, if our input is 1, we output a 0 and go back to state S0. If our input is 0, we go on to state S2 and output a 0. In state S2, if we get a 1 as an input, we can go back to state S0. But we have found the correct sequence, so we can output a 1. If we get a 0, we stay in the current state and output a 0. As you can see, we use less states with a melee machine, but the trade-off is more complex outputs. As before, to make a circuit for these finite state machines, we just encode the states using M0 and M1 for the more machine, and N0 and N1 for the melee machine. We then just make a state transition table for both. For the melee machine, we also add a column for the output Y, since that also depends on the inputs. Now we can make three chips for our circuits. One chip for the more machine, one chip for our melee machine next state logic, and one for our melee machine output logic. For our final more machine, we use a 2-bit register to keep track of M0 and M1. Our output Y is 1 if we're in state S3, meaning that M0 and M1 are both 1, so we can just put an AND gate here. For our melee machine, we again use a 2-bit register for N0 and N1, and we simply add our chips and inputs and we're done with our circuit. But all of these examples so far seem nothing compared to the application of making a traffic light controller. Let's imagine we have a busy intersection with two traffic sensors, TA and TB. Each sensor indicates true if there are people waiting and false if there aren't. We don't just have sensors, we also have two sets of traffic lights, LA and LB. Let's now make the finite state machine for a traffic light controller. Let's start off in state S0. Here we can just let LA be green and LB be red. We stay in this state until there are no more people at the TA lane. Then we go to the next state of S1, where LA turns yellow and LB still stays red to clear the intersection of any car still driving. Then we can go to state S2, where LA is red and LB is green this time. As before, we stay in this state until TB indicates that there are no more people waiting. Meaning that we go to state S3, where LB is yellow and LA is still red. Then we go back to state S0 and the cycle continues. With these encodings and this state transition diagram, we're almost done. 
Just simplify the equations and finish the circuit to get our finite state machine. As you might have noticed by now, flip-flops are extremely useful devices for storing data. But there's an even better way to store data with a memory array. And to explain it, I'll introduce three types of memory arrays, DRAM, SRAM, and DROM. But first, what is a memory array? A memory array is an array of memory cells. Each of these cells can either have the value zero or one. And the way we access one row here, which is called a word, is by using their address. So in this case, each word is three bits wide and there are four words, each with a different address. The output of a memory array is of course the data word itself. The main difference between RAM and ROM is that RAM is volatile, meaning that when power is turned off, all the data disappears, whereas ROM keeps the currently stored data. The two major types of RAM are dynamic RAM, or DRAM, and static RAM, or SRAM. I'm not going to go in depth, so I'll just give you a basic overview. DRAM uses a capacitor and a transistor as a memory cell in a memory array. This is very good at minimizing the amount of components we need, but retrieving the data is pretty slow, and the data needs to be refreshed every once in a while, because the capacitor is slowly losing some of its charge. SRAM uses two transistors and two NOT gates as a memory cell. It's called static because it doesn't have to be refreshed, but it uses more components. Although it's a bit faster to access the data, it's still not as fast as a flip-flop. As you can see, there are many trade-offs you need to make when deciding which memory element is best for which case. ROM uses a combinational circuit itself to store the values of 0 and 1 for the data. This has the advantage of it remembering the values even when power is turned off, but it makes it hard to edit the data, although there do exist some ROMs that can do this. One possible implementation for ROM might be with some transistors as you can see here. Having a transistor means to store data as 0 whereas not having one implies store data of one. Now I've learned a whole lot about memory, but we haven't even talked about arithmetic circuits. Click here to learn more about how computers do maths. 